Continue. Father, we're so thankful this morning for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your kindness toward us. Thank you for this beautiful day that you've made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And so this morning, Lord, we thank you for your people that have come with one mind and one heart and one desire to see you um, do what you desire to do in our midst, in our families, in our community, in our nation, in our region, in Jesus' mighty name. We commit this time to you now and everyone else that will jump onto this call. And we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to do your thing in our midst. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Revival. Revival um, happens when God's people desire the same thing that God desires. When our desire is united with God's desire, it paves the way for God to unleash his will upon people. And we saw that in scriptures, the unity that was in the early church, we find that vein right throughout the book of Acts. These two words are prevalent, unity and accord. And we touched on the definitions of those two words. They are singleness of mind, focus, and that word unity speaks of our hearts united with God's heart, and it's humming to the same beat. Whatever the desires of God's heart is at any given time, when our hearts are in tune with God's heart, revival will explode. I'd like to state that very clearly and emphatically this morning that this unity does not necessarily mean um, unity in the flesh. This unity is a heart that reflects the desire in God's heart. And so when we pray in tongues, we actually are praying the heart of God, the desire that is in the heart of God and, and our desire are humming to the same beat, the same direction. The book of Acts clearly demonstrated this. When we look into Acts chapter 15, verse 25, the Bible says, it seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. This same concept is found in Romans 15, 6. The Bible says that ye may be one, that ye may be one mind and one mouth, glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in the early church, recorded in the book of Acts, there was unity. And when there's unity in the body of Christ, tremendous things happened. And it's recorded in the, in the Acts of the Holy Spirit, the book of Acts. And so let's look at these scriptures a little closer this morning. So in Acts chapter 1, we see the New Testament believers continuing daily. Continuing daily. It was not intermittent. It was daily with one accord in prayer and supplication. Prayer and supplication in one accord. When we are constantly in prayer, we are aligning our hearts to God's heart. 
it's not what we desire as individuals because our desires in, as individuals are diverse. They are many, but unity according to the book of Acts is when the people of God align their desires to God's desire. And that's important for us to understand. They were in one accord in prayer and supplication. So prayer and supplication brings us closer to God that we begin to sense God's heartbeat, sense God's desire. So the scripture that we just read earlier on in Acts chapter 15, when the people were in one accord, they chose missionaries and sent them out. Why? Missions is the heart of God. When you are in sync with the heart of God, you know that God is in the business of saving souls. It, be, it be, becomes uh, your heartbeat as well. In Acts chapter 2, we find them worshiping daily with one accord in the temple, in the temple, and eating their meals with gladness and singleness of heart. The singleness of heart is when everybody has the same desire as God's desire, you find that there is a coming together. There is no other ulterior motives. There is no other agenda. There is only one agenda. And that agenda is to see God's will done right here on earth, just as it is in heaven. In Acts chapter 3, we see Peter and John healing a crippled man at the gate called Beautiful. The people rejoiced. But the religious leaders got very upset. And they called the two apostles before the Sanhedrin. So when these rulers of the people and the elders of Israel heard Peter and John, they marveled. This is what the Bible says in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Because all of the people that were there, people knew Peter and John. They were unschooled. They were not academics. They were just mere fishermen. The leaders were afraid to do anything to them because people had begun to follow them. There was a big following. There was a revival happening because God was ministering through people that waited for him in the upper room whose hearts have become synchronized with his heart. Their desires reflected God's desires. And that's what unity and one accord is. It is when God's people align their desires to God's desires. It is displaying, it is hungering after what God hungers for. The fourth chapter of Acts records the mighty prayer meeting the believers held. And that's why the enemy will do everything not to get us into a corporate prayer as believers. Your individual prayer is your individual prayer. But there is a place known as corporate prayer. Acts chapter 4, verse 23 to 24 and verses 29 to 32, here's what verse 23 of chapter 4 of the book of Acts says. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. 
And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea. Verse 29, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Verse 30, by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Now, did those believers get down and pray? And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants grace to endure the persecution and hardships. Grant that we can hold out faithfully to the end. Is that what your Bible says this morning? No, that's not what it says. If you look closely at these verses, let's grasp the idea of unity and accord that's expressed here. They could have been more than 3,000 praying here. It wasn't just the two apostles praying. It was the whole company of believers in Jerusalem. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, sometimes you don't feel like praying, but when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, you get up, you get up and you realize that you've gone through to go ahead and pray. We know that 120 persons were assembled on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 more came to the Lord after Peter preached his message that day. And so that makes it 3,120 believers. And there may be still more being added to this company. People who accept the Lord Jesus Christ after witnessing the healing of the crippled man in the, in the gate called beautiful. In Acts chapter 4, verse 21, the Bible says, all men, all men glorified God for that which was done. Now the rulers in those days warned Peter and John not to speak of that name. They couldn't bring themselves even to say the name of Jesus. That's how religion is. When, 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 when God's power is moving, people who are religious step back and become skeptics. But when you look at verse 30, we see believers praying by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. You see, unity is the key to the supernatural. It's the key that will usher in God's power. Verse 31 is the one that stands out, the one that I like. The Bible says the place was shaken where they were assembled together, where they were together, where they were in unity, where they were in one accord. The place was shaken. The place was moved by the Holy Spirit. So when we in the body of Christ begin to unite ourselves in that kind of unity, unity in the power of the word of God, unity where our hearts are aligned to the desires that are in God's heart, there will be a shaking. There will be divine visitation. And it will shake like it has never shaken before. 
the reason the supernatural power of God has not been demonstrated as God would have liked in the years that have gone by is because believers got only in unity at certain times. When you read the book of Acts, it was continuous. It was daily. And so I believe in these breakthrough sessions, God is going to stir up our desires to align with his desire and that it will be continuous. That even after you leave this platform, there is this continuous desire to pray in the spirit, to connect with God, and to align your heart with God so that you will hunger. Each one of us will hunger for the same thing. I believe in the last days before Jesus Christ comes, there is going to come a unity unprecedented amongst the body of Christ that the world has never seen before. And the power of God is going to be demonstrated like never before. Not in pockets, not in denominational lines, not people promoting that they are the true church or that they are where God is moving. God wants to move universally through his body. And his body is not fragmented. His body will be made whole where the desires of his people are aligned to his heart. What is your desire this morning? I'd like to ask ourselves the question again. What are we desiring? Are we desiring our own prosperity? Are we desiring our own breakthroughs? Are we able to see that kind of revival? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. God is going to do it again. But he does it in partnership with his people. He does it in partnership with his people where his people are united with him. We see, let's just talk about the way it, it, it's um, manifested. We talked about the seven spirits of God. The manifestations of the spirit of God and how God desires to manifest himself through his body, through his church. And we talked about the spirit of the Lord. And we heard that the Spirit of the Lord comes upon. It comes upon people for the sake of others. And Ezekiel, we talked about Ezekiel yesterday, that he was transported, you know, mightily. Without the use of airplanes, God translated him from one place to another, lifted him up, the Bible says. We also find a similar event recorded in the in the in the new testament in acts chapter 8 acts chapter 8 verse 39 and i want you to get excited with what god is able to do when his people are united with him remember it's not just the unity of ict it's the unity of people in ict People in the body of Christ, members of the body of Christ, who are united with the heart of God, with a desire that is in the heart of God. You see, when the body, our physical body, works very well, when each faculty are in sync with the heart. When the heart is healthy, the whole body is healthy and is in sync with the heart. And see what happens in Acts chapter 8, verse 39. The Bible says that when they, when they come up out 
of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. This was Philip, uh, the apostle, baptizing the eunuch. That the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now, every time you find this phrase, the Spirit of the Lord, in the New Testament, pay close attention to it. Because it just doesn't say that the Spirit caught away Philip. The Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. Remember, Philip was born again. And the Holy Spirit was in him. But this is another function of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit coming from outside, resting upon him. Translating him from one place to another. To do the work of ministry. The spirit of the Lord caught away. Took him away. From one geographical location. Plonked him in another geographical location. Because he was needed there. To do the bidding of God's heart. If you realize. It is not what Philip wanted. It is what God wanted. And Philip's heart was aligned to God's heart. When our hearts are aligned to what is beating in God's heart, revival will result. That's the word unity. Singleness of heart. Singleness of mind. The Bible says he carried Philip away physically. Not spiritually, where his body's left there and he's carried away. No, took him from one geographic location to another geographic location. You find that in Acts chapter 8. Now that's power. That's power demonstrated. And that's the spirit of the Lord. One of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 11. Remember, this is also what was manifested in the book of Acts, where Jesus said, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. The Holy Ghost comes upon you. This is the Spirit of the Lord. The Bible is talking about. Because the Spirit of the Lord empowers you. It empowers you to do the work of ministry. Jesus told his disciples, ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. This word witness comes from the Greek word matus or mata. You will be willing to lay down your life when your heart is in sync with God's heart. Witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the utmost part of the earth. But before this time, he told them to wait in the city of Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. Until their hearts was melted and molded and aligned with his heart. Bang! The Spirit of God moved free. And it's history. It's recorded that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came upon them and they received. They were clothed with supernatural power. Supernatural power to preach and to teach the word of God. When that happened, they went out and began to speak, knowing that the Holy Spirit would take mere words, impregnate those mere words with power to save those who heard it. Impregnate those words with power that would resurrect dead spirits. And Peter knew that power had 
come upon him. You will know when that power comes upon you. That was why he could tell the men at the, the, the gate called Beautiful. He said, silver and gold have I not. But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Acts chapter 3 verse 6. And when the man, faithless, you know, could not respond, the Bible says, they grabbed him by the hand and they pulled him up. And immediately he received strength and he began to walk. Peter knew he had power. He knew the spirit of the Lord was upon him. Let me remind you, church, each one of you here, that that same spirit that was upon Jesus, the chief cornerstone, is upon each one of you this morning. You are living stones. You're a royal generation. You are a priesthood, a chosen generation. Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to 19, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I hope you're catching this point because it means when the spirit of the Lord comes upon you, he anoints you to tell the good news. That's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed. Why was Paul not ashamed? Because the spirit of the Lord was upon him. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews first and also to the Greeks. You will share the good news when the spirit of God is upon you. And when you tell the good news, that's when the miracle happens. You might say, I don't know what to preach. I don't know what to say. No, you share the goodness of God upon your life. The same story that resurrected you from spiritual death. When that word departs from your mouth, it doesn't come to your hearers as near words. But it comes to their ears with divine power and the ability to give life. You speak the good news by faith that men are dead and without the spirit of God, they will remain dead. You are a witness. You were once dead in sin, but the spirit of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ ignited your spirit and resurrected you now you are alive and your heart beats to the same beat and the same desires as god desires we're disciples so that our hearts are aligned to god's heart so this morning we are called to pray because the more we pray in the spirit, the more our hearts will be aligned to God's heart. If we are not in prayer, we will have smart ideas that are our own ideas, but they have not been aligned to God's heart. When we pray and when we intercede and when we surrender, you will find the sensitivities that you have is aligned to God's heart. How do you know? Because it will be prevalent in the body of Christ. Your desire is to see souls ushered into the kingdom. Everything else are add-ons. 
your desire will be according to God's heart that lost souls will get to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and that lost souls will experience resurrection power. Resurrecting them from sin, from death to respond to the Christ. Some believers only uh, read their Bibles, teach, preach, sing, pray, and go away. They're in the meek and the quiet category. But as children of God and, you know, and do with power, there's more to this life that we're currently experiencing. We've got to have this power in our life, in our lives collectively. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is not word only, but in power also. 1 Corinthians 4.20. There is nothing as uninspiring as a Christian who preaches power without demonstrating it. When we preach power, we must be able to demonstrate it. And God wants to use you and I to demonstrate it. But our hearts and our desires must be aligned to his. If not, we become show-offs in the process. But when our hearts are aligned to his, he will direct you to the place where he needs you to demonstrate his power. I hope you understand this this morning. And how do we do this? We do this by devouring the word of God. We do this by surrendering ourselves to God and saying, God, what is in your heart? Align my heart. Because you see, everything that I've just said this morning points us to one thing. We cannot serve God without God. We cannot be aligned to the heart of God without giving the Holy Spirit preeminence in our lives, without extolling him as Lord. Lordship means we recognize that he is the boss, that we are not the boss. And when we come into his body, we work with his will, his way. Not our way, not our desires. What is God's desire? God's desire is written right there in his word. And this word becomes alive in us when the spirit of God in us is given the position of preeminence or lordship. And that can only happen when we surrender in prayer. That is why... I will always emphasize that you can pray in understanding in your homes, in your prayer closet. But when we come together into this forum, we will pray in tongues and we will develop our born again language. Because this born again language is unbiased. This born again language is praying what God desires. When we pray in understanding, we will always pray what we want, what we feel like. When we pray in the spirit, you can be praying for someone in South Africa that God wants at that point in time to have a breakthrough. Or someone in South America. Or someone in the jungles of Papua New Guinea who has called on God and God wants to enter into this atmosphere but he's looking for someone to give him the license. And this group on Zoom are praying in tongues and it gives him that opportunity to enter. When we pray in tongues, your spirit is in fellowship with God's spirit. And that is what develops the desire that is in God's heart to be our desire as well. When you pray in the spirit, you're speaking directly to God by passing your own understanding and the faculties of your intellect. You're talking to him 
About what? Romans 8 says, you are talking to him about things that you yourself cannot articulate in human language, in understandable language. The Spirit of God is praying through you with groanings and utterings that you yourself cannot articulate. When you pray in tongues, there is a laundromat happening within you, cleansing your faculties, restoring your health. Physically, the more you pray in tongues, the Bible says, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, that same spirit will resurrect your mortal bodies, not just spiritual bodies, your mortal bodies. The more you engage in tongues, the more the heartbeat of God becomes synchronized with your heartbeat. When you pray in tongues, you operate from the peak point of your faith. And you will begin to see and hear explosions of miracles around you. But you cannot take the glory for it because you don't know that it's happened. But you know in your spirit that you had a part to play in this. And God alone is glorified in the process. When your mind craves that you pray in understanding because it wants to have a part of the cake, discipline yourself to pray in tongues. And do it as often as you can when you're driving, when you're, when you're in the bus, under your breath. It doesn't have to be loud. It doesn't have to be um, scary and weird. You can be praying under your breath. When you're going into your workplace or into your business, what are you doing? You are leaving behind a trail of God's presence that when unbelievers come into the room, they will experience the tangible presence of God or the anointing that breaks the yoke. So this morning, know with me the spirit of the Lord is upon you. Because he's anointed you to preach the good news, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to share the powerful word. Remember, when the word leaves your mouth, it is impregnated by the spirit of God. And when it lands on the recipient's ears, it becomes the power and life that resurrects dead spirits. So this morning, Right where you are, we will pray in tongues. Switch on your mics. You can leave your cameras off. And we will begin to pray in tongues. And align our hearts to God's heart. Allow the spirit of God to cleanse us from within. And set things right. If there's unforgiveness, that unforgiveness will have to be settled. It will give you the power to do what you and I cannot do on our own. When we don't feel like, give you an example of, of when the spirit of the Lord comes upon you. You may be tired and you don't feel like praying, but you know you have to pray. You just heard the Lord tell you pray, but you're tired. and You're, you know, you're, you're in and out of that mode of sleep. And all of a sudden, you have this energy and you get up and you start to pray intensely. That is not your ability. That's the spirit of the Lord, the same spirit of the Lord that came upon Ezekiel and got him to his feet. That is his operation. But many times we don't attribute it to him because we just think, man, I just jumped up and I just started praying. Well, you didn't just jump up. The spirit of the Lord came upon you and infused you with energy to do the bidding of his heart. We must recognize when the spirit of the Lord is upon us. We do not want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're feeling tired. We're burdened from work. But all of a sudden, we meet someone and then bang, the spirit of the Lord comes upon us with a word that is 
relevant to the person's situation. And we didn't, we didn't, we didn't want to share the word of God. But the spirit of the Lord came upon us. And so this morning, you didn't just come onto this call because um, you've been notified that it's prayer meeting. The spirit of the Lord came upon you and you fought against sleep. You responded to your alarm and you're up to pray. You, that's what I'm saying. You have the spirit of the Lord upon you and we are going to pray in tongues. And you know that the spirit of the Lord has prompted you. This spirit of the Lord will also minister to people that you don't know. Only eternity will tell you, man, you, God will have all of eternity to link every prayer and every impact that you made because of your obedience and response to the spirit of the Lord when he came upon you.